Euromax Highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Hello and welcome to our Highlights edition. Let's kickstart the show today with a look at a few of the reports coming up for you in the next half an hour. Berlin by night. Photographer Robert Gahn takes his shots from an aeroplane. Dynamic duo. Rocket and Wink are ad executives who are worth the show themselves. And Affordable Art, that's the name of the fair that makes art accessible to the masses. There are thousands of books on the German capital of Berlin, so if you're visiting, you can have your pick of travel guides. Most of them will give you restaurant recommendations and, of course, an insight into the city's history. But perhaps the best way to get a quick impression of Berlin is through a photo book. There is currently a new one on the market by pilot and photographer Robert Gahn. He's combined his two passions to produce fantastic images of the city from a bird's eye view. The sky over Berlin. That's Robert Gahn's workplace. He's a specialist in taking bird's eye view photos. By day or by night. The 50 year old knows the German capital like the back of his hand. He's been a professional aerial photographer for 20 years. The best thing about this profession is sitting in the cockpit, not above the clouds, because then you couldn't take any aerial photos. In the cockpit, you can watch from above how landscapes change and develop over time. Gran was born in Potsdam, just outside Berlin. His biggest challenge is nighttime photography. Pictures as sharply focused as these were unheard of just a few years ago. The latest digital technology has made it possible. Earlier, cameras just weren't sensitive enough to light. And Gran has a favorite Berlin building to photograph, day or night. For the last 15 years, my favorite motif has been Berlin's television tower. Its polished steel surface makes it possible to take its picture from below at any time of day. And from the air, you get Berlin's skyline in the background. It's fascinating. No pictures like another. It's a new view every time. Kran is one of about 35 recognized aerial photographers in Germany. As a teenager, he dreamed of becoming a pilot. When that didn't work out, he became a photographer. Years later, he found the way to combine photography and flying. Photography was a roundabout way of coming back to flying. There are strict criteria for becoming a pilot. Back then I didn't qualify. And later I found the way via photography. At some point, after flying with lots of pilots to take aerial photos, I decided I wanted to fly myself. Sixteen years ago, he got his pilot's license. Since then, he's flown and taken pictures at the same time. That way, he gets exactly the angle he wants. If you're sitting two meters away from the pilot, he can't imagine exactly what you have or want in your viewfinder. And then at some point, after I had my pilot's license and enough flying experience, I realized I could combine them. Gran launched his own photo agency in 1999. It's one of the few in Germany that specializes in aerial photos. He has about 200,000 of them in his archives. He sells his pictures to newspapers and magazines, but also to private clients. Gran doesn't restrict himself to Berlin. He's taken aerial photos of Dubai, over the Persian Gulf, and in South Africa. For the 2010 Football World Cup in South Africa, we were the only photo agency that offered aerial images of all the stadiums. I went all around South Africa in five days. We spent eight to ten hours in the air every day. Robert Gran plans another photo book on Berlin, this time contrasting day and night photos. He may know the German capital from the air like no one else, but even after 20 years, there's always something new for him to discover.
And if you like to discover culinary delights, then you might want to check out some of the restaurant guides available. In the Michelin Guide's latest edition, they awarded 27 restaurants in France with three stars. We went to visit one of those in the Champagne region, where the establishment, as it turns out, has quite a tradition. At 39, Arnaud Lallemand is one of France's youngest three-star chefs. The head of the kitchen at L'Assiette Champenoise in Reims, he stepped into the ranks of the elite just a few weeks ago. He's known for his classic and purest cuisine. His specialities include spiny lobster and breast pigeon with radishes. L'Allemand remembers reading the renowned gourmet guide even as a child. I grew up with gastronomy guides. We read them a lot at home. As a child, I even knew the names of many three-star chefs by heart. As a youngster, he used to watch his father, Jean-Pierre, in the kitchen. L'Allemand knew then and there that he wanted to be a chef. I felt very close to my father. He took me with him everywhere. Grocery shopping at the market, to the vintner, and fishing in Bretagne. He taught me the importance of good ingredients. After training under several three-star chefs, L'Allemand started working in his family's restaurant in 1996. In 2001, he regained the Michelin star his father had lost. After his father's death, he took over at the restaurant and hotel. His second star came in 2005. His recipe for success is simple. I don't even feel like it's work. Every morning I'm happy to get up and go to the kitchen. Cooking is my passion. I give people my emotion and I get so much back. In October 2013, the Gourmillot Guide named Arnaud Lallemand Chef of the Year. And last February, he received his third Michelin star. Food critic Hélène Uris has followed his career over the years. We wrote an article about him when he still had two stars. And even then, it was clear he'd probably have a third one soon. That was more interesting for our readers, because it's easier to get a table in a two-star restaurant. Everyone wants to go to a three-star restaurant, and it's much pricier. What makes Arnaud Lallemand special is the quality of his products, the perfectly cooked dishes, and his outstanding classical technique. Big names like Alain Ducasse and Paul Bocuse brought French cuisine to the world. For many young chefs, they're role models. Back then, earning stars and other honors played an important role, and it still does. Here in the renowned Ferrandi Culinary School in Paris, students dream of getting a star one day. Every year, some 200 young chefs come here from abroad to get a taste of what French cooking is all about. French cuisine has an excellent reputation. That's in part because of its long tradition. And because the French care a lot about food. It's said they spend more money on food than people in other countries. France is also an agricultural country and has a large variety of products, along with many different kinds of wine and cheese. All of that, plus the sophisticated techniques, have made French cuisine what it is today. Classes are taught in English. A five-month intensive course costs 19,000 euros. Despite the price tag, there's no bitter taste in the students' mouths. The attention to detail, the techniques, the um, flavors, obviously, um, it's, it's, a, it's very specific French cuisine and so uh, you can't just you know, open a book and uh, follow the instructions in the book. You, you definitely will get a different result than by coming to Paris and actually working with the most professionals in the business. After graduating, the young chefs can become apprentices at top French restaurants, including Arnaud Lallemand's establishment. Now that he has his third Michelin star, L'Assiette Champenoise is always booked, but he wants to keep the luncheon price the same, at 68 euros, as his way of saying thank you to his longtime customers. 
Our restaurant has had good times and bad times, but people have stood by us. They've helped us, and I'll never forget that. That loyalty is very important to me. The young three-star chef also serves a dish in honor of his father, lobster with potatoes. His father first came up with the recipe in 1978, and now Arnaud Lallemand has given it a new twist. It's a special dish that he hopes will be a mainstay on the menu. Now, if you're in the business of marketing, it's rare that the creators share the spotlight with the product. But in the case of the German advertisers Rocket and Wink, businesses get the whole package. Aside from putting together successful ad campaigns, this duo from Hamburg have become known for remaining unknown. Very few people have actually seen their faces. And this calling card could well have contributed to the reason why they've just been named as Newcomers of the Year. It's showtime with Germany's craziest advertising duo. There's a pop star quality to helmet wearing Dr. Gerard Rocketson or Rocket and Petronius Armand Wink clad in jute headwear. Amid much excitement, they're presenting their latest campaign at a venue in Hamburg. Rocket and Wink don't talk on camera, but rely on Gerion Klug to be their humorous mouthpiece. But there's no point in asking about their costumes. What costumes? More serious answers are occasionally forthcoming. Pop music is a constant in the lives of Rocket and Wink. That is a fact. Music is a source of inspiration for Rocket and Wink. On the whole, they work together. But in their project, Rocket versus Wink, they are opponents. Their creative graphic duel has been going on for weeks. Rocket is red. Wink is blue. They present the results in their graphic magazine, Whatever. Visitors to the show experience the final of the duel as a live battle. The disciplines include whipping cream, playing chess, and tearing up telephone books. In what amounts to an entertaining art performance by two advertising professionals. Graphic design without rules. Sure, they're silly, but I still like it. The pictures are strange and so is everything about them. The concept works. It's about communication, right? So it's about making a brand. So they make a, made a brand for themselves. They've been going for three or four years and they're always doing cool new things. Rocket and Wink have worked on around 90 projects since 2011, including a Nike campaign featuring German soccer star Mesut Ozil. Last year, they designed posters for a series of concerts for a herbal after-dinner drink manufacturer. Numerous German musicians turned to them for their artwork. Rocket and Wink are designers, illustrators, product developers and artists who regard themselves as a think tank. They have reached the point where they can choose their own clients. Until three years ago, they both worked in major advertising agencies. They only employ two permanent members of staff in their little office, but that doesn't stop them winning awards. The Rocket and Wink style seems to have an international appeal. Heinrich Paravicini co-owns the Hamburg advertising agency Mutterbohr and is head of design at the German Art Directors Club, which recently gave Rocket and Wink an award for its campaign for a German newspaper. What makes this campaign so unusual is that we can determine how a major and rather traditional media organization like Axel Springer is willing to go for a campaign that uses street art and combines a sprayed look with the rough and the broken. That's very unusual. Every two months, Rocket and Wink change this billboard. 
The drinks manufacturer now on show is one of the agency's most loyal clients. Many Fritz Cola adverts have a vintage look. They are both minimalistic and classic. I would describe them as the figureheads of a movement. We're experiencing a kind of renaissance of graphic artists in the graphic design world, and it's been a major topic in Germany. The two of them pull it off perfectly. They love the craft, although one is more traditional and the other is seen as modern. But they love making a craft out of it, out of using their hands. How apt then that they should end their duel with a tug of war. Given the dizzying prices that top works of art fetch at auction these days, it's not much wonder that most of us feel completely left out of the market, one that seems to have spun hopelessly out of control. After all, who can afford an eight-figure sum for a Picasso or a Van Gogh? But don't despair, because Britain's affordable art fair aims to bring a breath of democracy back into the game. Here's how. Artwork after artwork finds a buyer. Visitors to the affordable art fair in London aren't exactly dainty about getting their hands on the goods. The prices, between 50 and 5,000 euros per item, are affordable for many people. The selection of arts on offer, I think, is the, the most uh, impressive thing. I'm having a little bit of a difficulty making a decision. <laughs> we bought two pieces already, and we're looking mm. at a third. Yeah. <laughs> More than a hundred galleries are exhibiting works at the fair. The atmosphere is relaxed with music and wine, making it easier for you to part with your money. Fifteen years ago, Will Ramsey founded the Affordable Art Fair to open the art market to a wider audience. Let's try and break down this preconception that you have to know about art to buy it, uh, this barrier that stops people going into a gallery. We put the emphasis on the visitors choosing uh, rather than me, the gallery owner. Here, art is defined by what people like. These three-dimensional pictures and maps are the work of Christiana Williams. The Icelander living in London also creates delicate masks. She and her three assistants design materials for her own label, as well as for Paul Smith and Chanel. The affordable art fair is very good because it's within a certain price range. So I think it's hugely important in terms of like introducing people who are otherwise slightly, you know, scared of buying their first piece of art. It's a very comfortable place to go and, and buy it, which for me personally suits me very well. <laughs> the works of Christiana Williams combine art, craft and design. Her sales channels are pretty varied too. She's not only represented at the art fair by her gallery, she also has an online shop and sells over the Rise Art platform. I think it is really good to have a site where you're able to get a good selection, quite curated, something that recommends different venues, like there you're able to borrow the artwork before you decide to buy it. The London startup Rise Art has more than 20,000 items to choose from. Layers of filters help buyers find what they want and for how much. Collectors who want to can set up their own profile. Founder Marcus Steverlink wants to reach different target groups. One type of customer that is basically looking for great art to complement their interior decoration or their house, you know, as they, as they invest more into that uh, living experience. And then we also have um, a bit more collectors, um, because we have art ranging from all the way from 50 pounds up to like 50,000 pounds. Rise Art also has pieces by famous artists such as Damien Hirst. For example, this limited edition of his spot etching Cineolo goes for 15,000 euros. But most of the work on sale goes for under a thousand euros. Like Kevin Dutton's photographs of plants, which are available on the online platform and at the fair. The online gallery, it's an excellent place to, once you've made the decision to buy an artist's work, perhaps choose which one you want. But I think 
places like this, where you can see the art on the wall, for me, I think that is still essential. Whether online or offline, traditional definitions of art are growing blurred. Fine art, pop culture, designer furniture and sculpture. Here, the opinions of art critics are no more important than those of the visitors. Whether in London, New York, Hong Kong or Hamburg, the affordable art fair has become a global phenomenon. One that shows that art lovers don't have to go to museums to get what they want. As with so much of Switzerland, the general culture combines a deep sense of tradition with a love for the outdoors. This is certainly true in the area surrounding Lake Lucerne. Here, there are many different altitudes on which you can explore a plethora of different activities. So, we decided to dive into the place, quite literally. Christoph Kramer is in his element among the weird and wonderful creatures down here. It's just a totally different world of peace and calm, and you're on your own. Total relaxation. His favorite hunting ground is Lake Lucerne. Sometimes the low temperature, 4 degrees Celsius on this day, means he has a maximum of 20 minutes in the water. The lake is surrounded by the snow-covered peaks of the Swiss Alps. The small city of Lucerne, just on the other side of the lake, is the cultural hub of central Switzerland. Christoph is a big fan of the city because of its variety of attractions and activities. I really like nature, I like sport, and I really like culture as well. And here in Lucerne I can go diving, skiing and also go to the theatre. Tourists are especially fond of the historical centre, with its vibrant mix of fascinating facades. The 14th century Kapellbrücke is one of the oldest covered wooden bridges in Europe. The town hall is also popular as is the Chateau Gooch that towers over the old city. But the most beautiful view is from the water. First stop is the Rigibahn Valley Station. It's the first mountain rack railway in Europe. The train has been climbing up the mountain since 1871. Martin Horat has been driving it for 25 years. Old technology, fire and water come together. The driver and the stoker have to work well together. It's a lot of fun. Visitors have a magnificent view at a height of 1,800 meters. Locals call the Rigi the queen of the mountains. And then they make their way back, by sled. It's almost become a national sport here. Eating is also a national sport, especially cheese. Locals here in Zelisberg have been making it for decades. Thomas Aschwanden's cheese business goes back three generations. Every day they transform 2,500 litres of milk into cheese. Cheese is culture for me. In French they would say le goût de terroir, the taste of the place. That's what we're trying to preserve. Night owls can find adventure at the ropes course in Engelberg. Robert Riedel loves to come here with his friends. A cheese fondue awaits them. It's very typical for the region here. To meet up outside, at night too. And then to eat a cheese fondue after going to the adventure park. And what better way could there be to spend an evening?
And that brings us nicely to the end of the show for today. So all that's left for me to do is say thank you for joining us on behalf of all of the team here in our Berlin-based studios. Until next time then, take care of yourselves and goodbye.